Uh, 1 Kings chapter, we've got a pretty long chapter here, pretty significant. <clears throat> we see here, as uh, Brother Robert mentioned in his prayer, that the dedication of the temple now, everything's built, everything's complete. Chapter 6 and 7, we got a lot of the details on the interior and on the exterior and all the, all the um, <clears throat> everything that just went into building this temple. And here, the overview of this, we see Solomon now um, blessing the children of Israel and making this great prayer unto the Lord where he, he, he built this scaffold and um, basically puts him kind of like a, a person's height above the crowd. So he's, he's standing up on his platform and he gets on his knees. And he's got his hands just, just out to heaven and he's, and he's making his great prayer and these requests unto God, basically just saying, look, when we screw up, when we do wrong, you know, I know this is going to happen when children just, just, just forsake you and they do other things and you judge them for it, you know, have respect unto this place. Have respect unto this temple so that if they turn back to this, turn back to you, that you'll hear from heaven and you'll forgive them and everything will be okay. You know, and this, that's, I mean, he goes through a lot of examples and we're going to go through pretty much most of this chapter, you know, verse by verse, but um, this is essentially what's going on in here. Um, I'm going to point it out at the very end of the sermon, but as we go through it, one, one of the things that, point, that stuck out to me is there's a lot of references in here that deal with salvation as well as how he deals with his own children. Um, and there's also a lot of areas where people get screwed up with their salvation doctrine from this chapter as well as from um, the, the corresponding chapters in 2 in Chronicles. I think it's chapter 6 and 7. But let's get, just jump into this before we even get into that. Let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So Jerusalem's where the temple is built. The ark has been resting in Zion. Where, where it's called the city of David, it's where David dwelt, and now because everything's finished, everything's built, everything's ready to go, the oracle's ready, uh, you know, it's good to go, now they're going to bring the ark of God, rest it inside the oracle, right underneath the, the cherubims, and, and um, that will be the resting place for the ark, and that's where it's going to stay. And um, so that's what he does. He calls, he calls the chief man to bring the ark in, verse number two, and all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast, in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those that the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are unto this day." There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stones which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So one of the things that I just want to point out here, it says that he offered, they offered up so many sacrifices that they couldn't even be counted. And when you think about how, I mean, early on in Solomon's life, he really loved God and loved the Lord and had an excellent heart at the beginning. And this is what we want to emulate is Solomon's early life. Because he really did, I mean, he didn't ever hold anything back. You know, when, when, he, uh, when he became king, right, and he offered up all of those tens of thousands of offerings and stuff, he went to the great high place and offered up everything before God blessed him with wisdom and God appeared unto him, you know, what, what can I do for you, Solomon? And, and he asked him for that great wisdom to lead the people so he would be a righteous ruler, and God granted him that. And now we see even after that, he's, you know, he's, he's took the time necessary, put all the resources in, and he made sure that the temple was made just right. And he cares a lot about God, and, and so much so that, 
you know, invites everyone out, and they have this huge feast. And, um, and they're, they're, they're sacrificing so much to God that you can't even, couldn't even be counted how many people brought stuff. Now, we get a count later on of how much Solomon himself offered, which is just pretty unimaginable numbers anyways in the tens of thousands. I mean, you're just talking about like, what does that even look like? How many animals is that? <laughs> just look at them at one time. But um, they just continue these, these sacrifices on God, so it's a great thing. The other thing I want to point out here is that in 1 Kings 8, 9, the last verse that we read there, it says that the only thing that was in the ark at this time was just the two tables, the Ten Commandments that was given to Moses. Now, prior to this, there was actually more things found in the ark, which had by this point now been lost. In Hebrews 9, 4, you don't have to turn there, Hebrews 9, 4 gives us the, the, the inventory of what was in the ark. It says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So within the ark, they had kept a few other things. One was their manna that God had sustained them with while they were out in the wilderness before they came into the promised land. They actually kept, because uh, uh, when they were, when they had come out of, out of the land of, uh, out of the wilderness of sin and into the land of Canaan, the manna stopped and God never gave manna again under the children of Israel. I mean, that, that was a miracle sustenance food that he had given to them, angels' food, for the whole time they were in the wilderness. And he commanded them to keep a portion just as a remembrance of what he did for them when he provided for them in the wilderness. And they had kept that in the ark with the Ten Commandments. And then they also kept Aaron's rod that budded. You remember when there was the people that were complaining about Moses and Aaron and, oh, why are you guys leaders? And you had this insurrection almost. And people saying, well, why can't we lead? You know, we're just as good as you. Who do you think you are? And God said, okay, we'll tell you who's going to be the priest and who's going to, you know. And it was um, all the, the heads of the tribes gave forth their rod. And, of course, Aaron's is the one that brought forth life. There were all these dead sticks and, and Aaron's rod budded. So they kept that also in there. But, um, of course, during the, the time of the children of Israel, and especially during Saul, you know, the, the heathen had stolen the, the ark of God. So we can imagine that at one of these points when they came and sold it, they took some things out of it. And we ended up losing the rod and the, um, the, the manna. But the tables were there, which is the covenant anyways, which is the most important aspect of it. And that has come back. And I think it's interesting that at this point now, even from the time of the temple, they no, they no longer had those other uh, artifacts that would have been kept in there from before. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. And one just one little note here on the, excuse me, God coming into the temple. Remember, we're going to apply this to where we are in the New Testament. This is a foreshadowing of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. So remember, the temple symbolizes our body. And when God comes and makes his home in this temple, and he says, I'm going to abide there, that's a foreshadowing of the Holy Ghost coming and residing in us in the New Testament where the temple is our body. But uh, I'll turn, if you would, keep your finger here in 1 Kings chapter 8. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 5 because we get a little bit more info here. And I just thought this was a little bit interesting. It kind of skips this information about it where um, what happens just prior to God the, the cloud that, that, that God is residing in, so to speak, filling the temple. We see in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, look at verse 11. The Bible reads, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar and with them in 120 priests sounding with trumpets. So there is music being played. We had the, the, the Levites, of course, um, they had the charge of the tabernacle and they had these various charges of who was going to break down the different areas and who was responsible for the, the, the utensils and, and all the various things, the holy place. Everyone had their own job. Well, when, it, when they moved to the temple, those jobs had to change a little bit. And um, one of the changes is that people now became you know, singers and music, musicians. 
Uh, and David kind of instituted that as, as new jobs for the, for the Levites to have in the service of the Lord. So being a, a musician was, was kind of added to their duties. And we see here that as the, at the dedication, when they're bringing the ark into the, into the temple, we don't get that from 1 Kings chapter 8, but we see that there's this, the, the Levites were playing with their musical instruments. In verse 13, it says, and it came to, even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. And I just think it's kind of interesting that it was at that moment when they're singing and praising unto God that then is when he fills the house. And, and sing and praise is important to God. God wants to hear us singing. He wants to hear us praising. It is a, 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 a strong aspect in our service to God is keeping music a part of that and worshiping our Lord with that with the songs of praise. Turn back if you would to First Kings chapter eight. I just when I as I've been doing these studies since there's so much parallels between uh, the books of the Kings and the books of the Chronicles. I'm trying to pick out the stuff that's that you know when there's more information given, and this just seemed a little interesting, and it gives you a little bit more feeling if you're trying to put yourself at this place, at this event, what actually is happening. Well, there's the, the singing is going on in addition to everything else with the temple being filled with this great cloud, God's glory filling it, the shining through, and the, um, of course, the, the Levites couldn't even minister in there. They had to, like everyone had to get out of the temple because God's coming in. And um, there's all this great singing and praising the Lord. And then, um, of course, he fills the temple. So let's Continue on here in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse number 12. Then spake Solomon, The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee in house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. Now, I just want to comment. What an amazing... I mean, imagine being in front of this temple and seeing this great... I mean, this supernatural cloud just filling up the temple. I mean, literally, visibly just seeing that. I don't know about you, but I'd probably feel speechless, like, <laughs> yeah. wow. You know, I mean, it, it, like the presence of God is just right in front of us. And Solomon is actually starts speaking to God now after he fills that temple with his glory and with, and with the, and look, this is, this is real. This isn't just some story. This isn't some fable, some fiction. This really happened. And, and, it's, and it's interesting to put yourself in these shoes. And you see, we, you see here Solomon starts speaking. He says, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Solomon was not ignorant of, of Scripture. Solomon knew all well. He knew that he was ordained to be the king. He knew, you know, through most of his life, he was raised well as far as knowing God's word and seeking the Lord with all of his heart, as David did. Now, he failed near the end of his life, but he, he, had, a, he had a great start for sure. Let's keep reading here. He says, verse 13, I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up, in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now I want you to notice that as we go through this also, the references to as the Lord promised, God said that this was going to happen and this happened. We're going to see this over and over. It's kind of a common theme. Look at verse number 21. And I have set thee there a place for the ark wherein is the covenant of the Lord which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord 
in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart, who hast kept with thy servant David my father that thou promisedst him. Thou spakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. And he's just, just giving credit and glory and honor unto God for keeping his word. Keep your finger here in 1 Kings 8. Turn back, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because these statements that he's making are being reinforced from much earlier from God's law, from that covenant that God made with Moses and with the children of Israel at that time. He said, there's no God like thee that keeps covenant and mercy. Our God's a merciful God. Praise God for that. Amen. But he's also a God that keeps his covenant. He keeps his word. There is no lying. There is no deceitfulness. There is no, uh, you know, I said this, but I'm doing that with God. None of that. Amen. Everything, every word of God is sure, and everything that he says stands true and stands firm unto the end. Deuteronomy chapter 7, look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, But because the Lord loved you, and be, this is where he's explaining why God chose the children of Israel and stuff. He says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. Look at this. The faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Important aspects of God to remember is, look, God's there. He's faithful. He's merciful. He, but he keeps his covenant and his covenant is sure. And he says, you know what? I'm going to be good to you. Do you that love me? I'm going to be good to you. I'll bless you. I'll be merciful. But those that hate me, I'm going to destroy them. You say, I don't like that. I don't think God should be like that. It doesn't matter what you think. I mean, it really doesn't. It doesn't matter. God is who he is. And don't be like so many others that... that you know, it's sad to see it when people don't like an aspect of God. They want to say, well, he does, he's not real then. Well, right. No, he is who he is. This is who he said he is. Um, and we need, to, we need to live with it and respect that too. And look, God's right. And if you think that God's wrong, then you're wrong. Right. We have to remember that God is a God of judgment. In order for God to be a faithful God and to be true to his word, we look at his words and what they said. And there's consequences for just disobeying God and going against God. Just as much as there's consequences for children that just completely rebel and go against their own father and, you know, in this world. You don't just, just get away with things. You need to respect your parents even so much more. You need to respect your creator, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love them and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 8. Let's see. My notes don't have all the verses. I'm trying to pick back up. Verse 25. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promisest him, there shall not fail him, saying, excuse me, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. And again, these are, these are words that will probably come back to haunt Solomon. But he's, he's saying to God right here, he's saying, you know, verify your word, God. You told my father David that you would have, he would have a son to rule before him. You know, and, he, and he knows what the requirement is. There shall not fail thee a man in, the sight, in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. He knows that he needs to walk before God the same way David his father did. And when he's saying this, that is his full intent. But this is all the more reason that no matter how much you know today that every man needs to take heed lest you fall. 
Because Solomon knew this. He knew he needed to walk in the right ways. He knew in God. He loved God. He knew his commandments. He wasn't ignorant. He, he, he knew scripture really well. Yet at the end of his life, we see what happens to him. We see that he ends up forsaking God. He ends up building all these altars of fake gods and stuff. And, he's, and right here he's saying, look, God, you are the God. What God is there like you that keeps covenant and mercy and, and, you know, and is so great? And then later on, the same guy that did all of this and knows all of this truth ends up, ends up doing all kinds of things that are contrary to that. So we need to let that sink in that we wouldn't think too highly of ourselves. I think that's one of the problems of Solomon is that ultimately the riches and the fame and everything got to his head. It got to him and, and he became corrupted. It just became too much for him to handle. All the wealth, all the riches, all the power, everything that he had ended up lifting up his heart with too much pride. And at the end of the day, that's what, that's what spoiled um, Solomon, which is why we need to make sure we keep ourselves humble. Even if you know the truths, we need to just beware of this, this present truth. Verse number 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. And I've heard, I've actually heard people mock like, oh, the temple, like, what do you think? God's just going to live in this house? No, he's not. And he's actually stating this. The Bible's saying right here, God is not bound. He can't be held by zero. And, and Solomon's even just pointing it out, saying like, what are you, what are you going to dwell in some house made by my hands? Like, you need that? Of course not. Of course we know that God, just as part of his being, is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God cannot be contained. God is not contained to one single element. However, God does manifest himself to us in certain ways. And there are ways that are easier for us, one, to even just understand and to deal with God, to, to, for him to manifest himself in some way to be made known unto us as with this temple. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 139, verse 7, you don't have to turn there, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in, ho in hell, behold, thou art there. God is everywhere. I mean, you can't get away from him. Yes, God is in hell. God is the one who, who and I don't mean God's being tortured in hell. God is just everywhere. I mean, look, if, if I'm going to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. You're not, you know, this, this idea that hell is separation from God it's just not true. It's not, fact, it's not biblically accurate. Now, you might say you're separated from the love of God. I'll, I'll buy into that because, yeah, God doesn't love you anymore if he's torturing and burning you in hell forever. There is no love for you there. God loved you at one point. He loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you to be saved. He really did want you to be saved. But once you go to hell, God doesn't love you anymore. And you're not separated from him because he is the source of the torture and the torment and the fire and the brimstone. He is the one that is pouring out that fury upon you. He's there. God cannot be contained. God doesn't just live in some house. He doesn't even just live in heaven. God is everywhere. But there are ways that make it easier for us to deal with God. And, and this is one of those ways. And, and ultimately, the temple is, is just a big symbol. I mean, it's a place for, to do some of the sacrifices, to perform the rituals, but ultimately, it's symbolic. It is something that stands for something a lot greater, and it's supposed to be the house of the Lord, something that you could reverence, but not worship. It's, it's something that's there to keep us mindful of God and to care for the things of God and to care for his house and to do, thing, do service to him here on earth. It's never meant to, to actually literally be like God's got a bedroom and God's, you know, like, no, that's not, that's not what it means. Um, but it is a place, it's a symbolic place for him to be dwelling among the children of Israel, among his people, to be right there with him. That's one of the purposes of that temple being there. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 28. But that's a, that, this is an important aspect of just who God is. It kind of helps to define that God can't be bound. He's like, you know, he can't be contained. The heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. There is no containment, no container for God to fit into. How much less this house that I have built in verse 28. Yet, even though this is true, yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there. 
that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked, to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. Now, I love these statements, and would to God that we could live in a country that put God as their king. We have the king right here. Solomon was appointed the king over the children of Israel. And you know what he's doing? He's asking God to be the judge. He's saying, God, when people make an oath between themselves and when someone does someone wrong, can you just hear before this temple and you judge and you make sure that the person who's right is blessed and the person who's wrong gets judged and you take care of them? He knows he has a physical job to do as the king, but he's ceding his power and, and, and recognizing God is still in charge. And this was the problem that the children of Israel had when they wanted a king to begin with, is that they didn't want God to be their king. But here now they have Solomon essentially in these statements saying that, God, you're the king. I want you to judge. Even with all the wisdom that Solomon's been given to be a good judge, he's saying, God, hear from heaven these, these cases, hear these matters and be the judge. The humility, if we can have that, how would people be living today if they knew that God was going to be judging? One of the reasons why there's a lot of you know, wickedness ends up abounding is when we have an unrighteous system, when we have unrighteous judges, when we have unrighteous laws and things that... You get away with it. I guarantee you people would be a lot more concerned about how they were behaving and the things that they were doing if they had it in their mind that God was going to be judging them. Seriously. Anyone that believes in God, if they thought, hey, God's going to judge me for this. Because oftentimes, more often than not, you don't need to worry that much about the, about the you know, human government. You get away with a lot. There's a lot of people get away with all kinds of things. There's a lot of people who are corrupt and, and, and susceptible to bribe and, to, and, and many other things to get you off the hook. And there's a lot of things that aren't even against the law because you would become too tolerant of, of wickedness and sin. Now, I'm not saying all sin should be against the law, but when you, when you have the attitude that God is the one that's judging, then the people in general that, that can recognize that will be living a much more righteous life because they're not going to be trying to just get away with everything because you know that you can't get away with anything in God's eyes. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein thou, they should walk and give rain upon thy land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. And he goes on and on, on on many different situations here. And we'll read a few more of them where the people do bad. They're doing wrong. They're facing some type of judgment from God. Then they turn back to God for, in order to receive forgiveness and for God to bless them again. Notice in all of these examples, God begins to punish them for their sin. Solomon is mentioning in every case here, and we'll get to more of them because he goes through a, quite a few examples, that the problem is the children of Israel's sin. And in every instance, he's saying, when you do this, God, because of their sin, when you cause a famine on the land, when you cause them to lose before their enemies in battle, when you know, there's a pestilence, when that, whatever is going on, because of their sin... He's not judging God. He's just saying when this happens as a result of them doing wrong, when they turn back to you, though, 
when they call back on your name, when they're asking for forgiveness and when they're turning their heart back to you, please hear and, and forgive them at that time. He's not, he's not asking for anything before that. He's not saying take it easy on them. He's recognizing, you know what? When they're doing wrong, they need to be judged. When the children of Israel are doing bad, yeah, keep going. Keep doing it. You know, send the famines. Don't bless them. Don't bless them with the rain. Don't bless their crops. Don't bless their food. Don't bless their battles. But when they get right with you, you know, God, please forgive them. Please help them. And, and, and when they turn from their wicked ways, they recognize their sin. When they recognize their sin and repent, then they're asking for God to forgive and restore them by removing his punishment from them. Now, what people like to do here is, and we just read this in verse 35, he says, when heaven is shut up and there is no, and that, that makes sense, right? Hey, when we're doing bad and God's just, just chastening us and disciplining us and not being for us, when we stop doing bad and start doing what's right, make it stop, right? Remove your punishment from us. It makes perfect sense. But what doesn't make sense is when people want to turn to this verse and say, see, in order for your soul to be saved and not to go to hell, you need to turn from your sins. That is not at all what this chapter is teaching and even this verse. There's a huge difference between the way God deals with people, with his nation, and with his people and with his children than there is with just an unsaved person and them being saved their soul being eternally saved. Let's read this verse again, verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. He's not saying when they turn from their sin, then forgive their sin and give them eternal life. He's saying when they turn from their sin, forgive the sin and then bring the rain. Because in this situation, he said, you stop the rain because they're sinning. Okay, right. When they stop sinning, when they turn from that sin and get right, then forgive them and bring the rain again. That's what he's saying here. It has nothing to do with a soul's Salvation. It's something that makes perfect sense, though, for how you deal with your children. <coughs> I don't want the whole sermon to be about this. It's just an important point, though, when people want to say, because this, the reason why I have to go to verses like this is because turning from your sin is hardly found in the Bible at all. I mean, especially the phrase, like, turn from your sins. It's just not in the Bible at all. This is the closest thing that you're going to find is they turn from their sin and have any then association with forgiveness or something like that. Very few and far between. You'll find a few more frequently times when it talks about people turning from their wickedness and turning from their evil ways. And um, Ezekiel is probably the biggest place that the work salvation crowd really loves to turn to. Ezekiel chapter 3 and um, 33. 3 or 35. I don't remember all the references, but there's a few places in Ezekiel, one in Jeremiah, where he's talking about the, the people turning from their sins or turning from their wickedness or turning from their wicked ways. It's not, it's not turning from your sin because turning from your sin is only in a few places in the Bible. This is one of them. But um, salvation has nothing to do with you turning from your sin. Jonah 3.10, which is one of our memory passages, um, explains clearly and it's defined as being works. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil he thought to do unto them, and he, and he did it not. The, um, when God saw their works, they turned from their wickedness, they turned from their sin. This is works. When the children of Israel turn from their sin, when they realize what they've done, then forgive that sin. See, there's a temporal forgiveness as well as an eternal forgiveness. Eternal forgiveness is what we receive when we get saved. Temporal forgiveness is, is just um, the, the forgiveness of, of the things that you do that, um, that you're in the wrong for that, that aren't eternal judgment, right? I mean, once you're saved, you don't have that eternal judgment to face at all because you've been forgiven, you've received uh, eternal life, but you still could sin and need to be disciplined. It's the same way my children don't need to ever worry about me destroying them in a furnace of fire. 
but they do need to worry about me disciplining them for when, what they do wrong. And that's how God treats his children. It's the same way. But um, let's keep going here. And we'll, we'll see. Just keep that in mind. We're going to see a few more examples here going along the, the, the same point. But, um, oh, before, yeah, before we even get into that, actually, I had one more point. In 2 Chronicles 7, so 2 Chronicles 5 and 6 is parallel to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8 is real long. 2 Chronicles, it's split up into 2 Chronicles 5 and 6. But then in chapter 7, which we're also going to get into in chapter 9 next week, is God's response. So all of chapter 8 is Solomon praying to God. God responds to Solomon. God gives an answer to his prayer. And he does answer his prayers. And he, he kind of repeats some of the same things that Solomon is mentioning. But one of the things that's not going to be in the passage next week in 1 Kings chapter 9 is in 2 Chronicles 7. And it's a very famous passage. And we, we actually hear this during political seasons also. For, uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Right? Very popular passage of Scripture. Great, great passage of Scripture. I wish people would actually treat this seriously and not just give lip service to it. But notice what this is talking about. Again, it's mentioning people turning from their wicked ways, people turning from their sins. But the important thing to, to pay attention to is, is if my people, which are called by my name, this isn't talking about the lost person that needs to turn from their wicked ways in order to be forgiven of God. This is talking about people who are already saved. They're already God's people. They're already his children. That they're the ones that need to humble themselves, pray, seek God, turn from their wickedness, and then God will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And as a nation that has once been very highly promoting of Christian values, many people that can be called by his name here, this is what we need to do. If we want any type of healing from God. Now, I think we're kind of past the point even of healing with all the wickedness that's been done prior, with all the innocent blood that's been shed. There's judgment has to come. But what we can do is hope. And, and if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves, if we humble ourselves, let's pray, seek God's face, and turn from their wicked ways. But see, that's the problem. Too many people today don't even want to recognize their ways as being wicked, let alone turn from them. People are too en en enthralled with their sin and with their, with their holly weird and, the, and, and their booze and their drugs and everything else. I mean, I don't care if marijuana is legal. or I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. I don't think it should be illegal. But it just kind of shows you how the culture is just a bunch of drunkards and wine bibbers in general that just... I mean, more and more people now, it seems like, are just promoting. It's, it's not that they're against marijuana being illegal um, for the same reasons that we are, right? We don't think it should be illegal because it's not something the Bible says it should be illegal. We're, we're for a real small government and, and not having all of these extra laws that are unnecessary. But most people in our, in our society want it to be legal because they want to do it. Because right. they want to be able to do it freely and openly and that they just care about getting high. That's why most people want to have that legal. The people who are, you know, getting their green cards and their medical marijuana cards, you know what they're doing with it? I know plenty of people like this already, just acquaintances, other people, you know, just extended people that we know. They're just doing it to get high. They don't have any, they don't have any medical problems. They're going to say all day, oh, yeah, I've got this problem, that problem, because they want to get their, their, their pot card. But these are the people, you know, and, and if this is God's people, this is the wickedness they need to be turning from. And, and, many, and among many others. But it's just this whole degradation of the society that's happening today. We need to turn from that wickedness. We need to seek God's face so that God can hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land. <clears throat> Let's keep reading here. Verse number 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, 
Whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. <coughs> God is the only one that truly knows what's in a person's heart. And again, this pleading to God, for God to hear and for God to judge and for God to see, is awesome. I mean, I, I would love to be around more people. I mean, our church is full of them, but... but People have this type of an attitude. You know what? God knows the hearts of the children of men. I want God to judge. God's going to be a rightful judge. There's a lot of people here, not here, there's a lot of people around today in general that are wicked on the inside and we don't even know it. But you know what? God knows it. You know what? I want God to judge those people. Those, those wolves in sheep's clothing, the people that are, that are just extremely wicked and that so many people don't know it because we can't see the heart. God could see their heart. Yeah. And... We want God to be able to judge. We want him to forgive and to do and to give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. Keep reading here, verse 40. That they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Again, realizing that God knows your heart, you can't get away with things from God. You ought to have fear. You ought to be able to fear God knowing that what he knows. Verse 41, Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake. For they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm. When he shall come and pray toward this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, <coughs> that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people Israel. And that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. This is a very important passage showing the nature of desiring foreigners to be saved and having them to be treated like one that's born in the land. This attitude was corrupted by the Pharisees from the children of Israel, from the nation of Israel. We see here this awesome attitude of Solomon saying, you know what? And it started when God gave the, the law to Moses saying when there's a stranger in the land, you treat them like one that's born in the land. When someone comes and they're going to worship the Lord and they travel, they could become and join a part of Israel and they could worship and, be God, and, and worship the Lord with you, alongside you, and be a brother to you. And we see this taught here again as Solomon's praying. He said, you know what? He didn't just forget about the strangers. He didn't forget about the foreigners, the people that want to come and convert to serving the Lord. He didn't forget about those people. He said, you know what? When they come, because guess what? They're going to hear about it. Which was the whole point of God choosing a nation to begin with is that he wanted to have this great lighthouse. He wanted the other nations of the earth to hear and see, wow, there is a true God. There is a God of the earth and of the heaven. And there is a God that lives among men. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the same God, the Lord Jehovah, who rules and reigns from heaven. And he says, they're going to hear, when they hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand, of thy stretched out arm, when they come to this house, he's going to hear them too. Yeah. It's not just about the children of Israel. It's not just about us. It's about anybody that comes. And he says, um, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all the stranger call to thee for that all people of the earth may know thy name. This has always been the desire of God and of the people who truly serve God. Solomon, he's saying, I want everyone in the whole world to know your name. They all need to know who you are to fear thee as do thy people Israel. And they need to be like us. We fear you. We want the whole world to hear so that they can join with us and that they may know that this house which I build is called by thy name. But we saw in, uh, turn if you would to Isaiah 56, keep a finger in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, Isaiah 56. This attitude was corrupted and you see that throughout the book of Acts. You see the, the, the racism and how they, they treated themselves as being superior to other races. I've taught this before. You could go back and listen to my series in the book of Acts. It's, it's through so many of the chapters how they wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. They wouldn't have anything to do with them. They would, you know, there is so much attitude and arrogance that they had and pride of how much better they were than the Goyim, than the Gentiles. 
<coughs> the Jews that lived in this time, it came from the Pharisees. Now, a lot of other people were affected by this attitude, and it became part, more part of their culture, but that's not how it started, and that's not the way that God wanted it either. Look at Isaiah 56, verse number 1. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And, and you know, I, I wasn't planning on doing this, but we're in this chapter right now and we see the eunuch thing here and with that stupid false her that heresy has been going out with the Born That Way Ministries. This is so clear what it's talking about what a eunuch really is and what what he's saying here in Isaiah 56 he's saying don't let the the stranger or the eunuch basically say that essentially that they're forgotten or that there's anything wrong with them you know in the Lord because he's saying you know what don't let and so he says in verse 3 neither let the son of the stranger that joined himself the Lord speak saying the Lord hath utterly, utterly separated me from his people because he hasn't because he wants you to be part of his people and he says, neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. And that dry tree is in reference to him having children, because then later God's saying that I'm going to give you an everlasting name. I'm going to give you a place and a name that's better than that of sons and daughters. So don't worry about not being able to have children, because that's what a eunuch is, is someone who can't have children because they've been castrated. And if you want to say they were born that way from, you know, from their mother's womb, they were sterile from their mother's womb. There some before something happened where they can't have children because that's what a eunuch is. It's someone who can't reproduce. It's not someone who doesn't have a desire to be with someone of the opposite gender. That's stupid. Then why would he be worried about having children? If you weren't attracted, you could, you could have children without even being attracted to someone of the opposite gender. You could still have children. It's still possible. There's still a way to do it. I mean, it's, 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 it's so ridiculous. And, and I don't buy that for a second anyways. The Bible never says anything about attraction to, to a certain gender or whatever. But I'm going to get off that because that's not what this sermon's about. And, and anyone with, with, with half a brain cell can figure that one out. The point that I'm making here and I want to, want to draw your attention to is the stranger. Because that's what we're dealing with here. That's who Solomon was praying for, is that people would recognize the foreigners and people who don't look like us and people that are from another part of the world and don't look down upon them when they come to worship the Lord and they take the Jehovah as their God, that they're just like one of us now and they could come, hear them, God. They're just like us. The same way that we call on you, they're calling on you too. Hear them. There's no difference. There's no respecter of persons with God. Amen. He says in verse 6, Also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbaths from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even, and look, he's talking about people who love him and keep his commandments. Because that's what we're seeing here. Those that are keeping the Sabbaths, those that are you know, listening to him, hearkening to him. He says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. God's house is a house, is, is a house of prayer for all people. So I don't understand the people that, that have any type, you know, there's racism in all forms still in Christian churches. You've got, you've got people who, I mean, I have heard about this. I've had, uh, Pastor Romero told me about someone he knew that like there's this church that, that they're like racist against black people. Like they literally are, are just completely racist I, and it blows my mind. Like how can you get that from the Bible at all? Moses was married to an Ethiopian woman. What color do you think she was? Do you think she was a Caucasian? Because I don't think so. I don't know any Ethiopians that, that, would have been, that wouldn't have had dark skin. 
I mean, even the Jews themselves, that, that, you know, in the Bible, they, I'm sure they were a darker color skin. They're not these white guys. And who cares anyways? But the Bible doesn't mention anything about their skin tone and their color. Like, is that mattering or making any difference? But we see the exact opposite. Not only are there people that are racist against, you know, whites against blacks and blacks against whites, but you have the, 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 the bigger problem with racism are the, the, the Christians who want to exalt the Jew. Uh, the Jew of nationality who are just, just naturally born Jewish. As if they're better than everybody else and they get this free pass and they're these special people, you know, chosen of God that, well, they, you know, yeah, they're rejecting Christ, but it's not that big of a deal because they're still God's chosen people and eventually they're going to come, you know, what? Don't be a respecter of persons. God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. Amen. It doesn't matter. Yet, too many people are, are, are focused on the wrong things. Turn back, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. <clears throat> Pick up here in verse number 44. If thy people go out to battle against their enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, and shall pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house that I built for thy name, then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of their enemy far or near, yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captives, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. We see the same pattern over and over and over again being repeated here. And what I want to point out in this passage in verse 46 there, it says, For there is no man that sinneth not. So we see another important, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I want you to kind of keep your eyes open for this is the, just the, the, all these little points about God and salvation and how he deals with his people. Is, is There's a lot of little pieces that are found just in this one chapter that you can prove to people, even from the Old Testament, different aspects of God that we find common in the New Testament. You know, easy, you know, we usually turn to Romans 3.23, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God when you give someone the gospel. Well, we could see even here in 1 Kings chapter 8 that there's not a man alive that, that sinneth not, right? I mean, we're all sinners. It's evident. It's, it's, it's throughout Scripture, but we find that even in this passage. Let's keep reading. Verse number um, 49, Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron, that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them and all that they call for unto thee. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord. And this sums up the concept of the forgiveness of God's people who were already saved from the furnace of iron in Egypt. That's what he's saying here. Look, these, have all, these are your inheritance. This is your people that you've sanctified, that you've called out from the midst of the furnace of iron. You've already saved them out of that. But they would later sin, that if they would turn from their sins and turn back to God, God would forgive them. This is not how a soul is saved, as I mentioned earlier. This is how a saved soul stays right with God or gets back right with God. And this is important for us to remember because as long as you're still on this earth and God hasn't taken you yet and taken your life yet, as a, as a believer, as someone who's saved, you need to remember to turn back to God with all of your heart when you catch yourself backsliding. People come, people go. I've seen people come and go through church, but what they need to remember, and if, and if this ever happens to you, remember this sermon, this preaching tonight, that you need to turn back to God with all of your heart and with your soul and your strength and just return to God on that day when you just wake up realizing, what have I done? What in the world am I doing? How did I get into this mess? 
Because we serve a loving God who is merciful. And all the problems that you're having, I'm not saying you're not going to have any more problems, but God can extend a lot of mercy to you because you know what? The reason why you're having all those problems is because he wants you to turn back to him. Because he's trying to get your attention. Because he's trying to say, son, 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 come back. That's what he wants. Now, some people get carried away to the point to where they just end up losing their life here and there's no more, no more ch chastening that, that God's going to put them through. Just, okay, well, that's it. But we want to we stop before we ever get even close to that point and catch ourselves in, in, our, in the midst of our backsliding when it happens. And um, even if it's a grievous sin, you know, a lot of people want to just give up and just throw in the towel. God keeps his covenant and his promises. Now, this covenant and his promises was for that temple, right? But it's a much greater principle that because, again, that temple was mainly just symbolic more than anything. God wants us to turn our hearts back to him. The actual physical location, ultimately, it doesn't matter that it's not there today. We don't need to pray towards that temple. Um, we can, you know, we could pray straight to Jesus. Because he's the mediator between God and man anyways. The man, Jesus Christ. The priesthood has been changed from these times. So let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 54. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Again, it's just, it's awesome to see like, not one word. God keeps all of his, everything that he's promised. I'm looking forward to, I'm, I'm actually going to be preaching, I don't know if it's going to be this Sunday or next Sunday, but I'm going to be doing a, 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 night, a morning service and an evening service. We're going to deal with the prophecies and the things that have not failed from God's word. All the things that he said, and I'm going to pick and choose my favorite parts that I think are just super awesome, of, of prophecies fulfilled, God's word being, being made, the claims being made here, this many hundreds of years have gone by and now it's being fulfilled, and all these various things that have happened from scripture just, just showing God in these words with no other explanation for this happening, no people, you know, conspiring to create this book and to do it, to have it form so perfectly impossible. And then I'm also going to do another sermon, and I mentioned this before, where people, the naysayers want to say there's contradictions and problems and errors in the Bible too. So we're going to get the, 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 the positive of the, of the fulfilling and the attributes and, and the every word of God, the promises coming true, as well as the dismantling the, the claims against God's word. So that's coming up soon um, to a church near you. <laughs> but uh, so I'm excited. That's why I'm even bringing it up because I'm excited about it. I just, I just thought about this the other day. I'm, I'm going to be putting forth a lot of effort into this too to, to com you know, combining all this, all this material and try to, to present it in a way that will glorify God. Let's keep reading. Verse number 57. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. What a great prayer still. He says that the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us or forsake us. We ought to be, be praying God you know, not to leave us. We know in our salvation he'll never do that. But not just that, but his presence. It says that he may, because when his presence is with us, he's saying that, that he may incline our hearts unto him. God, help our hearts to be more inclined unto you and unto serving you. Our hearts oftentimes are wicked and they want to stray and go off into sin and go on off in other things. God, we don't want you to leave us as a people. We want you here among us that you may incline our hearts unto you to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. We need that presence of God to help us to keep his word and to do what's right. Verse 59, And let these my words, wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord, be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant, 
and the cause of his people Israel at all times, as the matter shall require that, look at this again, verse 60, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. The, the, the plea so that everyone could know. It's always been there. When there was a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the change of the priesthood, the way they went about these things was a little bit different. The temple was gone and, and, and the local churches were established, but the attitude has still always been the same. There's always, always, always been the desire for the whole world to get saved. Verse 61, let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. This is how these things will come to pass. We need our hearts to be right, to, to obey God, to keep his commandments and to do the things that are right. Notice all the elements of how God deals with his children and even the salvation. I'm just going to summarize it for you. Um, we saw, we start with the ark containing God's law being brought into the temple. Back in verse number nine, we saw that God is a God that keeps his word and expects you to keep the covenant also. Remember, they bring the covenant in and, and we're reminded how God is a God that keeps his word. He's a God of his promises and he wants us to keep the covenant also so that God can judge when we're, you know, when we're sin, when we sin and we break those things. Verse 46 shows us we're all sinners. There's none that's, that's not a sinner, and we need to expect punishment when we break his laws. But if we confess and forsake our sins, he will forgive us. And all these various aspects have been kind of brought into this whole chapter. Um, and it's, it's a great chapter. It's this great prayer unto God. And we're going to see God's response in chapter 9. Let's just finish off here. Verse number 62, And the king... And all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord. Two and twenty thousand oxen. Twenty-two thousand ox, oxen. That's a lot of oxen. Yeah. That's a lot. And in hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. See, this is just what Solomon offered. That's why in the beginning it said it was without number. I mean... When you got 120,000 sheep and then you have all these, you know, all the children of Israel coming and they're bringing sacrifices too, right? I mean, Solomon made sure everyone was cared for. So the people who didn't have any, you know, the poor people didn't matter. They, they were able to eat and to, and to feast and to um, rejoice in the, the building of this temple, the dedication. But with everyone else bringing it too, they just, they just lost track of it. Verse 64, the same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, meat offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. So the, the, the main altar that was meant for the daily sacrifices, for these other things, it just wasn't fit to handle this big surge of all of these sacrifices being done. And that's basically what it's saying there. So they had to hallow another altar and, and, and have that going. Everything's going at the same time in order to, to meet the need of all these sacrifices that are being made to the Lord. And at that time, verse 65, Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him, a great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days and seven days, even 14 days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away. And they blessed the king and went unto their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. Fourteen to two weeks of just sacrificing unto the God, fellowshipping and, and <coughs> celebrating this, this great event of the, of the temple being established. What a wonderful Savior we have. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great lessons we could learn from these chapters in the Old Testament, dear Lord, uh, for especially in this chapter, 1 Kings chapter 8. There's so many things here that, um, that are found in the New Testament. We see that you truly are God that doesn't change and you're God that keeps your word and your covenant, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us that our hearts would be inclined to serve you, that we would be thinking about you being the judge and, and that, um, God, I wish for your judgment, Lord, and I know sometimes that may be a scary thing when we get into sin, but it's a needful thing, Lord, and we need to, uh, to keep right with you. And I pray 
that you would please watch over us and protect us as your people. Lord, help us when we stray, but then we repent and get right with you, dear Lord, that you would hear us from heaven and that you would forgive us and, and be merciful unto us, dear God. We pray that you would please continue to open up our knowledge and our wisdom, God. And we also pray for you to stir up our spirits um, the, for the rest of this month and beyond as we continue our challenge to try to preach the gospel to at least one person every single day. Lord, we pray that you would please bring people in front of our paths that would be receptive to hearing your word, that, um, that we could be very fruitful in our endeavor this month. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.